Um, my apologies to everybody. <laughs> if I start coughing, it's because I've got COVID. And uh, so I'm uh, uh, dealing with that, <laughs> really, just the cough. <laughs> This is uh, uh, content for the evening is really what I'm looking at here. Uh, and we'll just cover five different areas. If you want to interrupt uh, and ask a question, uh, you may do so. Um, and then there'll be some time for questions afterward as well. Okay, it's not switching slides, there we go. Okay, the path. Uh, US lacrosse tasks <laughs> All the officials, um, associations like club to train, rate, and certify umpires. So that's what we're doing right now. And here's the path you are on. Uh, <clears throat> join U.S. Lacrosse. View all uh, USL online training videos designated by club. And I'll get some details on that later. Um, attend new umpires orientation, that is this. Um, let's see, uh, and then there's the all umpires clinic on the 20th at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, attend rating day, <coughs> we'll have more about that. And uh, then take the combined NFHS and USL youth test. Uh, Kevin, you had a question about that. Did you find that? I'm going to try and get on there a little bit more tonight or tomorrow. So I'm off these next couple of days and go and find out who's knocked out. If I have a problem, I'll reach out to someone and okay. just to make sure I'm taking the right test. Okay. Sorry, mute again. If you Here's Hallie. Um, yeah, uh, club, is requester, club is requiring all its umpires to take the combined NFHS, combined high school and youth test. So it's, there's three tests, they're all 50 questions, but uh, club wants you to take the combined test. Okay, uh, come on. Why be USL certified, be prepared, training, be insured. There's a really nice insurance package, uh, not only for, um, uh, or liability if you get sued by some parent or something, <clears throat> which we haven't had happen, uh, but also for injury on the field, lost wages, uh, uh, cross wages. And then uh, Chris and I will not assign anybody who is not certified. We'll be prepared, be insured, be assigned. Okay, Chris, my voice is starting to go out here. This videos. All right, I'll talk a little bit. So uh, I'm Chris Niblock, and I am the assigner for the greater Louisville area, the, the Kissel Lake. And we do not have, as of this time, a middle school season scheduled, but I would normally do the middle school uh, seasons as well. Uh, John and I are doing the training, so we really want everybody to ask all the questions that you need to get asked because uh, there's sometimes some confusion out there, and we just want to clear up any confusion that anyone might have with regards to what is required of them in order to be put on the field. Um, and as John's mentioned, he's going through some of those things right now. Uh, you have to do some online training. And U.S. Lacrosse has done a pretty good job this year, um, the last couple of years actually, of, of putting things online for us to be able to see and take. Um, everybody that's on this call should be doing at least the level one learning class th um, through the e-learning portal of U.S. Lacrosse. And the classes that we require are listed there and they will be in your e-learning portal and their professionalism rules one through four, minor fouls, goal circle fouls, major fouls, misconduct, penalty administration, and two-person crew mechanics. Uh, the two-person crew mechanics are something you're gonna be doing on February 28th. Um, some people on this call might be doing the three-person mechanics. 
Uh, generally, our games are two person. Uh, we do have some that are, are three, but at a minimum, you need to be pretty well versed in the two person mechanics. Um, and I will be sending out the first go around of the rating day schedule here over the weekend. So I'll be looking for that. Um, and then we also have to do the annual rules interpretation, which this sort of helps go over today. And then the youth rules, which normally we would have to be fairly well versed on, but this year it doesn't look like uh, there is going to be a, uh, a league run through the schools, although there will be another league run um, privately at King Louis on Sundays. There's going to be a, there's going to be a middle school, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, middle school league in Lexington. Okay, so that <laughs> that'll be good. So, uh, so that's that's great news for Lexington. It'll give the officials a chance to work on their game and uh, give those players an opportunity to to um, to get better before they they get to the high school level. Thanks, John. All right, so one of the things we have to do and one of the things that we can control is sort of our knowledge of the rules. Um, there are a lot of things we can't really control, um, and, but one of the things we can do is get into the rule book and, and be prepared. Uh, the test that we are requiring everybody to take is the combined test. There are three tests, but the one we want everybody to take is the high school and youth combined. It's 50 questions. 85 is passing. Uh, you can take it as often as needed to pass it. Uh, you know, it's an open book test if you want to print it ahead of time and then go through it, even lists the rule that is in question. Um, John and I are also happy at any time to answer questions, not just about the rules test, but just rules in general. I sort of serve as like the rules interpreter and, um, for the for club for the state as well as the supervisor of officials so if you have a question be happy to address it um i would rather you give me a call and ask what you think is a silly question versus having you call me after a game to say that you know something came up and you'd asked you thought about asking but you didn't but you know lo and behold that situation arose so ask the question we're happy to address it um, the rule, it's an open book test. So, you know, get in it. You've got about two and a half weeks to finish the preseason training, which should give you plenty of time to do that. John, you got anything? No. Okay. So for the high school season, uh, we are using the 2020 rule book. Uh, because there are no changes for the 2021 season. Uh, the points of emphasis are, are always something that we want to stress. And in particular, uh, it starts and restarts. Delay a game, meaning when a player um, interferes with someone's ability to self-start. So as John just put up there, uh, and I don't want to read everything, but when we do a self-start, uh, the rule book does say that they're supposed to be starting within a stick's length of where the foul occurred, but we know that when a player is running down the field and she gets fouled, invariably it's going to take her several steps to stop. Um, and they don't really need to stop. They just need to show that they recognize that a foul was called and we don't want to consistently interfere with the team transitioning down the field by making them come back two steps. Um, that is not what we want to do. We want to have the game more free flowing. That's one of the reasons why there are self starts and free movement. And by constantly readjusting them and bringing them back, we're disadvantaging them. 
Uh, but then again, we don't want them to be gaining an advantage by self-starting too far away uh, from where they were, for instance, below the restraining line. If the foul occurred above the restraining line, we want them to self-start above the restraining line, not below it. Um, other than that, we, we want them to show that uh, they recognize the foul and playing distance again is with a stick's length, but you know when they're transitioning down the field, it's 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 impossible for a player to stop within one step, uh, which is essentially what a playing length, a playing distance is when they're sprinting down the field. Um, when a whistle is required to start play and a player self starts on their own, it is a false start penalty. Two years ago, when these when self start came in, we were allowing the player the benefit of the doubt. Right now, uh, we want to make sure that they're starting when they're supposed to start. And if they have a question, they can ask the question, and we should be able to tell them that, you know it's a whistle restart, or they can go ahead and self start. Uh, you're not really coaching; they're asking the question, and we're giving them an answer. Hey, Chris. Yes. It's Greg. Yes. So, so a, a foul occurs. We blow the whistle. We point the direction that the play is going. We make the call for the foul. Yep. Does the player have to wait until those two things are done before they take off? No. No. So no. we may be making a call. Yep. And they're going. Yeah, and that's okay. why direction. Uh, so you, you blow your whistle, tweet. Direction is sort of the first thing that you should be doing because you want to tell everybody what, Sort of who is who you're awarding the ball to. I got you. Uh, yeah. A lot of times it's self evident, but you want the direction first. And sometimes we never even get the signal out for what the foul was because they're going down the field. Um, and again, the onus is on the player who's getting awarded the ball. If she decides to self start when a defender is right in her face, that's on her. If she takes that step, she has self started. So the only evidence of recognizing the call is not evidence of recognizing the exact nature of the call. It's that a call is being made and she needs to stop. Stop or... Or slow. Yeah, yeah. Re recognize if she's sprinting down the field, it's sort of like a rolling stop through a stop sign. You know, she's, she's sort of putting on the brakes, but she doesn't come to a complete stop. She, you know, she's got that hesitation, then she can continue going. She has recognized that a foul She's good called. then. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank yep. you. Yep. Yeah, and, and as Greg did, anytime someone has a question, please just chime right in. Uh, we're happy to go over all these. But uh, again, these are points of emphasis. Um, with the pace of play increasing, uh, offensive, defensive delay of games outside the critical scoring area and with boundary restarts important. So again, uh, a boundary ball is not a foul. Ball goes out of bounds. They can come inbounds. They don't have to stop. They can run inbounds and, and keep going. Uh, you know, again, a, a defensive player is supposed to give them the ability to step on the field and start so they can't be like setting up a wall one foot off, one foot inside the sideline. They're supposed to give them two meters of space. But once they step on the field, they are self-starting and can be played. Um, attempting to self-start beyond the playing distance. You know, again, these are what we could consider to be delay of games. You want to look for something that's persistent, that is uh, continuing, that that always is occurring. Um, we want players who foul to move away from the player with the ball, give them that two meters of space. But again, if the girl self starts, it's on her. And self starting occurs by two things: passing the ball and taking a step. So once they've done one of those two things, they have self-started and can be played. Um, and the last thing was we can manage those by giving green cards or possibly yellow cards for persistent delay of game foul. So if the if a defensive player, defensive team is constantly not allowing the players to, to self-start because they constantly stand right in front of the player, and take their time going behind them because depending on the foul, they're supposed to go four away or four behind. So if they do a major foul, they're supposed to go four behind. And if they continually sort of stand right in front of the player and take their time to sort of move away and get behind, they're delaying her from self-starting. We need to address that. 
that can be start with a verbal warning and then you can start with a captain say look you guys are delaying it we need you to get out of the way when you have fouled then you can go to a green card and then you can upgrade it to a yellow thanks john We're on repeated fouls now, Chris. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, right. No, I, again, so this is a big one. Uh, repetitive fouls, um, and these are like horizontal sticks. Uh, I see it all the time, not just indoor, but outdoor as well. A horizontal stick to the body is a foul. And if we don't call it, the players are going to continue to do it. Uh, it doesn't really take a lot of effort for a player to move their hands like this in a legal position. But if they make st stick to body contact and the stick is in a horizontal position, then it's a foul on them. And, but if we don't call it, the players are not going to change their habits. So we need to make sure we call it. And after numerous calls, if they don't adjust to how you're calling the game, then you can start carding. Um, and you can start by doing a yellow card after numerous calls for the same foul. They haven't gotten the message, yellow card it. We have the ability at any time to upgrade fouls. So you're upgrading a major to a yellow. Um, and as it says, any foul called on the field is considered a warning to all players. So when you're calling a foul on one of the teammates, it's sort of warning to all the other players and it should be a warning to the coaches that we're not going to allow that play to continue, that type of play. And so they should adjust. And if they don't, you address it with the captain and then you address it through your louder whistles and cards. Um, let's see, officials must be aware of, of teams and players that continue to foul in particular situations. Uh, you know, again, transitions, one of them, teams are going down the field. Sometimes teams foul on purpose to slow down a quicker team. You sort of need to be aware of fouls that occur while they're trying to play good defense and fouls that occur because they're trying to slow a team down and, and it's sort of a professional foul, if you will. Um, and you need to recognize when players are just not very skilled and, and, and they foul. But again, it's why we can hold for advantage uh, we, we need to recognize when a foul has occurred and the offensive team is moving down the field and the girl is past the defender, by blowing the whistle, we are disadvantaging them, disadvantaging them even further by making them sort of stop, recognize the foul. So if there's a foul, maybe a stick across the body as she's dodging someone in the midfield and she's past the defender, but there's a stick across the body, which is a foul, hold the arm for advantage. By blowing the whistle, you're disadvantaging the attacker again because she's past the defender. So again, we, we need to sort of recognize those things. If you do hockey, it's, it's, a, it's a skill that hockey officials have because you, you recognize the foul, but you're giving advantage. So we wanna make sure that we're doing that. So any, any questions about advantage? Yeah, Chris. Yep. So would that only be, for, would that even be for major fouls? Yes. And would it be for fouls? It would obviously not be for fouls that are carded. Or would it? No, I so, guess I should ask. Would, would it so, also be like a check to the neck or the head? So would a couple, you ever? A couple things on, on that. And it's, it's a good question. Um, so in the critical scoring area, when we see a foul, we raise a flag. And the flag shows that we recognize the foul, but we're allowing the team to continue on toward goal. In the midfield, outside of the critical scoring area, we, we can't raise the flag because they can't be on the scoring play outside the critical scoring area. So we use an arm to uh, show the advantage. You can come back. So for instance, if, if a girl gets fouled, maybe just outside the 12, maybe she's passing to a teammate and she gets jacked by a defender as she's passing to her teammate in front of the goal, you can show advantage for that foul and maybe the team shoots and scores and you can come back and you can card. 
So oh, okay. you can come back and card. And then we would start with a free position at the center because we have a card. We've got a good goal. So make sure, you know, the sequence is tweet for a goal, time out, show the card, show what it's for. And then you're showing direction that you're going to restart play. And when you go back to center after everybody is subbed out, again, you, you're going to call timeout. You're going to show what the foul was, direction that the play is going, and you're awarding the ball. So that's okay. just the way, the, the, the way we do it. But yeah, so, okay. yeah. so, so to let you know, um, yeah, you wouldn't want to maybe allow for maybe, maybe the goalie and this happens sometimes when the goalie comes out of the goal circle with the ball, attackers who are riding, their eyes get big. Yeah, right. And, and a lot of times goalies get hit in the helmet with a check, and that's a check to the head. You wouldn't want to hold that because the ball is going to be right there. Yeah, yeah, near the goal. Not, right. You're not preventing them from, from scoring. You don't want to have to call off a goal. Right. right. Okay. Uh, but generally, if you see a card in the midfield, you're probably going to stop play right then. Um, but like I said, there, there could be an instance where they could be just outside the 12, passing to a teammate who's open, and they could be shooting the score. In that case, you're sort of disadvantaging them twice if you stop play. But good question. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Anybody have any uh, other questions on those? So, again, uh, you, you – we, we want to allow the attacker the ability to run down the field, but we want to also make sure that we're, we're calling the fouls. Um, so it's sort of a fine line of when do you blow the whistle, when do you not blow the whistle. Okay, shooting space. Uh, one of the tougher ones that we have in the game, uh, John was nice enough to put some of these things together. And it is like an ice cream cone. So again, uh, shooting space is pretty much the only um, immediate whistle that we have. Uh, every other foul that we have, we can, for instance, if it happens inside the critical scoring area, we can raise a flag for advantage. We can't do that with shooting space. With shooting space, we have to blow the whistle immediately for it because we don't want the attacker to shoot and possibly hit someone and hurt someone. Um, as the green box mentions, the shooter always has the responsibility to shoot safely. So in many cases, we actually could have offsetting fouls where the defender was in shooting space, but the attacker shot unsafely. And, and just because they shoot, because we're late with a whistle, doesn't mean it's automatically a card for dangerous propelling. There are many attackers who are skilled at shooting and they could do a bounce shot by the defender. Um, you know, they could shoot high above her because they're in their shooting motion. They're waiting for us to blow the whistle. Um, so don't assume, and it's not an automatic that just because an attacker shot, she should be carded for danger of propelling because they can propel in a safe manner when someone's in front of them. Um, but in many cases, you actually could have offsetting fouls. The defender steps in front of the, the, the attacker. The attacker shoots and hits her. So we have offsetting fouls for shooting space on one side, danger propelling on the other. We've got – does anybody know what we have at that point? It would be a card on the shooter. We have alternate possession. Good, good. So we have offsetting fouls. So we have alternate yeah. possession. Yeah. So we have a yellow card on the shooter and we have a, a shooting space violation on the defense. So, so what are we going to, how are we going to set that one up? On the dot. Good. Right. So we're going to have um, anybody will be able to take it on the dot. Because there's free movement. So a player on the attacking, on the uh, defending team, because we have, well, whoever gets alternate possession. Will right. And the opposing team player will go four away between the dot and the goal they're defending. And just make sure that you keep track of alternate possession. So I use a rubber band on my wrist. So for me, it's pretty simple. I don't write it down on my card, 
But for instance, when I'm looking at the benches, if the team on the left has alternate possession, I'll have a rubber band on my left wrist. So when we go to change, it's very simple. Just take it off, put it on my right wrist. So I'll know looking at the benches, the next time we have alternate possession, if we do, it's going to the team that's on the right side because that's where my rubber band is. So I don't have to worry about riding on my car, pulling out, you know, in bad weather with gloves on. It's just very simple. I just put a rubber band on my wrist and it's just an easy way to keep track of it. Yeah, makes sense. All right, so this is a good video that will show, um, we won't show the whole thing, but this will show what you the, find the a student put case, together. It's perhaps the most difficult rule in women's lacrosse to understand and to officiate. The following lesson will help umpires, coaches, and players understand shooting space and what requirements need to be met before the call is made. When shooting space is present, it is an immediate whistle. This foul may not be flagged. Additionally, if a shot is taken and a goal is scored during a shooting space whistle, the goal does not count. It is impossible to know when the goalie relaxes in this situation. Therefore, the penalty stands and the correct penalty setup must be administered. When discussing shooting space, it is important to note that the defenders who are within a stick's length of any attacker, ball carrier, or otherwise are not in the shooting space. Umpires must be positioned to see the space between players to determine whether or not a defender is within a stick's length. Note that the definition of this is literally within the length of a single stick which does not include the player's arm length. Trail umpires must not be directly behind the ball carriers. They should be offset. What does this mean? To the left or right and not directly behind. This enables the umpire to have depth perception and see through the space. First, let's visualize the shooting space. It resembles an ice cream cone with the ball carrier being the point on the cone and the goal circle being the ice cream. The edge of the shooting space is where the goal circle meets the goal line extended, not the edges of the cage. Notice the difference. Officials should be aware how shooting space changes as the ball carrier moves toward the goal, and also how shooting space changes as the ball carrier moves from the low hanging hashes to the middle. Players are allowed to have their sticks in the shooting space lane as long as their body remains safely out of the lane. In the two-person system, the lead official will be looking up at the shooting space lane on her side and the trail official will be offset looking down the lane for shooting space. When an 8 meter is awarded at the hanging hash and defenders are cleared along the lane, see how many steps it takes to be in the shooting space. Hey John, can you pause it real quick? Potential. Okay, so this this video was made before the penalty zone was put in. Um, wish they'd updated, but they didn't. But it's a really good video what they did to show visually what shooting space is. So uh, prior to a couple of years ago, this was something we had to be concerned with. But now at the penalty zone, everybody is cleared out, so we don't have to worry about people stepping in. Um, on free positions that are on any hash because they're all cleared out. So again, that's this situation which they're talking about right now will not occur now because of the penalty zone, which goes down to pretty much where the yellow line is, um, like the soccer line or maybe that's the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the field, it's field hockey lines, the yellow lines here. Um, these lines are pretty much where five meters away. So everybody would have to be below the yellow line. So no one would be able to step into shooting space on free positions. Shooting space will happen more quickly in this scenario than the next example where the shooting space is set up at the top of the eight meter fan. Here it will take multiple steps for a defender to arrive in the shooting space lane. So John, can you pause that real quick? So again, the, the low defenders in our game today will not be there. They Everybody has to clear out of the penalty zone, so you don't have to worry about them. The only player in this 
situation here that we need to be worried about is the player in the adjacent hash. And again, defenders are awarded uh, or given the opportunity to get to an adjacent hash. But if no defender steps up to that adjacent hash, then an attacker can get there. Um, and you just want to be aware of jostling, but pretty much the change of the rules took the jostling out. But uh, a lot of times two defenders will try to get there quickly and push one of them forward. The pushing is, is fine. Uh, but if you've got a defender on that hash and the next person to them is an attacker, that doesn't mean a defender can sort of push them out of the way to get up to their teammate. So if the next person in line is an attacker, the def next defender doesn't get to push someone out. They get one person on the adjacent hash. And after that, sort of it's first come, first serve. Thanks, John. The first criteria for a shooting space call is that the attacker must be looking to shoot. Here it is to shoot. Here it is clear the ball carrier wants to get the ball to her teammate behind the goal and she is not looking to shoot. Watch when she gets the ball a second time. She is clearly looking to shoot. This is something the umpire judges based on circumstances of the play and visual cues from the ball carrier. Watch how differently the player looks when she is looking to shoot. The next criteria needed to make a shooting space call is that the ball carrier must have the opportunity to shoot. This means the game situation presents the attacker a clear and safe way to shoot. Watch as the attacker in double and single coverage is being so tightly marked she has no opportunity to shoot. It is always the shooter's responsibility to shoot safely. She may not shoot through defenders if the defenders are within a stick's length of her or are within a stick's length of her teammates. The following scenes hey, Chris. show your game situations where shooting space. Yeah, Greg. So to draw back on that, so we've got that number 18 who's in the shooting space, but of course she's been double teamed, so she wouldn't be shooting, but is she allowed to stay in there that long without yeah, so, marking up anybody? Well, the two white players, number 18 and white, are you asking about? Well, it, can, John, can you back that up a little bit? Opportunity to shoot. This means the okay, game. Okay, now watch number 18 right now. Right. So okay. she's not marking anybody. Right. So we're that we're gonna count three seconds. So we're on three seconds for her, right? Right. right. Okay. It's, it's not. It's not a. Vis, it's not a visual. Oh, not, not, okay. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 That's, that's fine. It's a good question. So yeah. So we're we're looking at her right there. Uh, this three seconds is in effect once the ball comes below the restraining. Below the restraining line. line, and she's not marking up anybody. Correct. So. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure I understood yeah. that part. Okay. Great. Is that the ball is that the ball carrier opportunity to shoot? It is always the shooter's responsibility to shoot safely. She may not shoot through defenders if the defenders are within a stick's length of her or are within a stick's length of her teammates. The following scenes show familiar game situations where shooting space is not present. Defenders who stay with cutters within a stick's length who are being drawn through the shooting space by attackers are not in shooting space. Shooting space is not a one-to-one -one ratio like the three seconds call is. 
It is possible for multiple defenders to be guarding a non-ball attacker. When this happens, none of those defenders are in shooting space. However, some may be in three seconds. The attacker is the player ruining the shooting opportunity here, not the defenders. Watch this legal play, which shows a defender with a great understanding of the shooting space rule. Do not penalize the defender who makes a quick adjustment to get out of the shooting space lane. Remember, defenders may leave their sticks in the shooting space lane as they approach the ball carrier, and once they are within a stick's length, can then position themselves in front of the attacker. Here are some examples of shooting space violations. Watch a textbook shooting space call. Officials should be ready to make a shooting space call as soon as the ball enters the critical scoring area. Defenders who choose to mirror the attacker who is playing behind the goal are exempt from the three second count in the eight meter. However, they are still responsible to have ball awareness and to adjust to the play and stay out of the shooting space. Here is an example of a proper adjustment made by an aware defender in order to avoid being in shooting space. Remember defenders who are drawn through the shooting space who maintain a stick's length marking distance from an attacker are not in the shooting space. When defenders wish to leave their mark to go to the ball carrier, they must do so while staying out of the shooting space. This scenario must be timed appropriately because when it is not, it will result in a shooting space call. Here is a defender who incorrectly leaves her mark to play the ball carrier. The goalkeeper, while dressed in protective equipment, must also abide by the shooting space rules when she leaves her goal circle. Watch the goalie in the shooting space lane. This must be called. Zone defenses can lead to shooting space being present since defenders will often be positioned just above the eight meter, but not marking an attacker. Hey, Chris. Yep. Or John. So would you guys, just for a moment, talk, go back to where we had a triple team okay. and you were talking about none of those would be in the shooting space, but they could potentially be in three seconds. Right. So, so, so how would we know which, how, how does that, how do you call that? Okay. So, right there. so the player who is getting triple team has the ball, right? So in this instance, they can all be around her. There's no time limit. They all can be within a playing distance of her and they can stay there uh, for as long as they want. As soon as she loses the ball or passes the ball to a teammate, then two players then are responsible for getting out of the eight. Oh, oh okay. Once she passes possession to somebody right. else. Right. She always allowed one marker and the other two become, I got you. Right. Okay. right. So, yeah. So when, okay. good question. so as long as she has the ball, she can be surrounded by any number of defenders, but a player that does not have the ball in the eight can't be surrounded um, by players and they can't continue to stay inside the eight. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. I was called in the critical scoring area, officials should be aware of where the players are at the end of the play so they can be moved appropriately. Here are the officials' roles All in right, John. And clearing the lane. When a major foul has... Pause. Okay, so again, uh, we don't have to worry about moving them to a specific area anymore because we have free movement. So our game became a lot easier a couple years ago, uh, thankfully. And so we don't have to take that snapshot and say, okay, you were here, you were inside of her, you've got to go here. So if there's a foul between the eight and the 12, we're putting her on the 12 and we're clearing the lane. Uh, the person who fouled goes behind. So this, it's a little bit different from, um, from the way it was and we're happy that they changed it this way. occurred in the critical scoring area outside the eight meter the lane will be cleared and players should be cleared so as to maintain relative position to the ball 
and other players at the end of the play. Since this play was called by the lead and is closest to the lead, she will direct all players to stand and will set up the foul according to the seven step whistle plan. Her partner should be engaged in making sure players don't move until they are instructed and that they go where they were told and maintain relative position. When the same scenario occurs on the far side, the trail will need to be more active in assisting the lead and making sure the lane is clear since only the trail will be able to visualize this. When fouls occur inside the eight meter arc, the entire arc must be cleared. For major fouls, the arc in the lane needs to be cleared. Players are cleared with respect Sorry, I got a lazy finger, I guess. Well, come on. Well, gee whiz. Are we finished with this slide? <laughs> yeah, if you want to move to the next yeah, one. I, I, I don't know what I was doing there. Okay. All right, go ahead, John, on this one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk as long as I can. Well, not as long as, as, long as I need. Um, I think Chris has been inviting uh, everybody <clears throat> onto Arbiter and Arbiter Pay. Um, really, two things I just want to stress. One is there's a little bitty box on your main page on your account that says check if you're ready to assign or ready to assign. Check that so that we know you're ready to assign. It's really hard to find sometimes. If you can't find it, let us know. <clears throat> also, I've got a PowerPoint tutorial, and that might be uh, uh, a little bit dated. It's, it's uh, maybe two or three years old, um, but on how to get onto Arbiter, how to handle all the problems, blocks, and so on. So if you need any help finding that, <laughs> I'm <clears throat> um, happy, ha happy to help you. Chris, you can probably speak to rating day. Okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the day, everybody needs to have a current rating in order to get put on games. And so I'm putting together a schedule. Uh, currently, the rating day, we're, we're shooting for February 28th. It's going to be at Sacred Heart on their back grass fields which is, is going to work out nicely. So one of the fields is going to have probably varsity games. One of the fields is going to have JV games. One field will have probably three-person mechanics. The other field will have two-person mechanics. So everybody needs to be there. Um, I would suggest you get there at least an hour early so you can watch games, ask questions, and then you'll have probably two halves worth of games. Probably um, you'll have a half followed by uh, 20 minutes of, of watching the next half. And then you'll get back on the field. And that way you can sort of digest a little bit about what you've heard and been, have been told. And then you can get back on the field. So uh, everybody needs to be aware. I've sent out several emails on this. I've heard back from a couple of officials with, restrictions on when they can do games that day. I've not heard back from other people. So I assumed you're good from 12 o'clock until six o'clock. So the schedule will be coming out and we will get everybody out there. If there's inclement weather or an issue, we will go to the turf field and we're going to get everybody out there as much as we can, but because of only one field, uh, it's going to be a little bit less, but they do have lights on that field, which sort of helps us. Uh, we can go a little bit longer in the day, but we're restricted uh, to a 12 o'clock noon start time. So just be aware that a schedule will, will be coming out probably this weekend showing uh, what time you're out there and who you're going to be with. Um, so just be aware that, you know, you're out there to practice. Uh, the teams are out there to practice. We're out there to practice. You're out there to ask questions. So that way, when the season begins, you'll have a game under your belt. Uh, if you're a new official, you will be paired up with um, a more experienced official that has several years under their belt. And you will hopefully be able to ask 
those officials questions throughout the game, after the game, before the game um, on situations and scenarios, but just be aware the schedule will be coming out this weekend. Anything needed <coughs> to highlight? No, we have two different start times. So the Commonwealth <laughs> League, with John uh, assigns, is essentially every team outside of the greater Louisville metro area, except for the Northern Kentucky Notre Dame team, which plays in the uh, Kentucky Scholastic Lacrosse League, which is the greater Louisville area. Everybody else plays uh, under the Commonwealth, which Greg is the commissioner of that's on this call. So they will start on the 1st. Louisville area starts on March 6th. Um, John, do you want to talk about the Woodford County Jamboree and if you need officials or people? Yeah, for it's, uh, I've, <coughs> I've started assigning it. Um, it's, it's a big one, uh, about 35 games, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And um, I, I have not assigned anybody who has not been certified or rated or anything yet. So I've just been getting returning officials right now. That's all. Are you open to having all newer officials on those games? <laughs> what, what are your thoughts? Um, they're all high school. Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, this, yeah, that, I wouldn't have a problem with that. I mean, we, we're going to, Greg, Greg knows that I'm going <laughs> to have to have first year uh, umpires working. Well, I did last year. Um, I, I know. Some some of you who are on this call, uh, I know uh, Sarah, um, uh, Alla. Um, yeah, I, I probably pronounced your name wrong. I'm constantly doing that. Um, but you all, I think, uh, did games, um, and that was your first year. So yeah, I I put first year um, officials on that. Okay. Um, and also for me on the assigning side, uh, I will start to assign the first two weeks of the season. So from March 6th to about the 20th in the next, uh, I'll, I'll, no! start, <laughs> I'll start just after ratings day, uh, because I'm going to be watching everybody on ratings day to sort of get a better idea of where you currently are. And then I'll start assigning games after that. So if you need to go into Arbiter to block days or times, <laughs> or if you have special restrictions. So for instance, your home is in Shelby County, but you work near Ballard. And so you could do games in that area. Please let me know um, because the only address that I have in Arbiter is usually your home address. Uh, but if you work somewhere close to some other schools, maybe maybe you work uh, near Male High School, and so you got collegiates over that way. Male Manual Stadium's not too far. Those things help. <coughs> so just communicate with us and let us know if you have any special restrictions or if your place of work has you going somewhere or. John has a need for officials in the E-Town and Bowling Green area. So if you have a trip planned, business trip or something for E-Town or Bowling Green, uh, and you could do some games after your business is done, let us know and uh, we'll take care of you. Yep. All right. Anybody, I mean, Greg's done a great job in asking questions. Um, <laughs> Any, anybody else have questions? And I'm assuming, John, you've got everybody's name down that is attending. I'm lacking three. I'll, I'll get it here real quick, okay. though. Let's see. People can ask questions, though. Go ahead. What is the thing that's happening on the 20th? I never got an email about that. Who is that? The All Rules Clinic. Is that like the five hour thing that we did last year? Uh, yes, only it's not gonna be five hours. Okay, good. That's great. Yeah, the 20th are our general it's membership. It's nine o'clock, it's Zoom. Yeah, it probably, what, what do you think, an hour and a half, John? 
Yeah, I, I don't even. Yeah, yeah. Can you send out the link for that again? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think Steve Ranth was supposed to do that. I'll make sure he he does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. I don't think I ever got like any information about that, so that was new to me. Okay, I'm sorry. Very uh, good. Thank thanks. you. Um. Hey, Chris. This is Mark. Yep. Uh, just re I, I'd heard some things uh, through Eastern about uh, some delays. Are, are the games still on schedule to start in early? Yeah, the, yeah. We had there was a very hastily put together meeting for this past Monday that that then very hastily and quickly got canceled. So uh, I think something was going to be announced, but then it got changed. So I had communication with Scott Ricks, who's the commissioner of the girls league um, for Kissel the other day. And he did not say anything about any changes. So we're still on for March 6th. Greg, you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, we're still going, we're st some of our schools are actually starting on the first. If you're outside of the Fayette County, if you're inside the Fayette County, they've decided to start on the fifth. So that we're, we're still on go for that. Okay. And John, you noticed that the Lynch's have two people on the call. Yes. I, I actually, I didn't, I see Tyler too somewhere. So yeah, there's Tyler. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No, that's all right. Yeah. I saw the ugly one, I assume, is Mark, not Amber. Oh, John. Well, I wouldn't be so sure. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> oh, Tyler. <laughs> All right, so again, uh, John and I are really, you know, we're, we're both in, in that stage of our life where we have a lot of time to answer questions. Should you have questions later uh, that you'd like to address maybe in a quieter setting? Um, my cell number and email is in the Arbiter, John's is as well. I believe our cell numbers are on most of the emails that we've sent out regarding this call. So um, please reach out to us. I'm, I'm happy to field any and all calls with regards to rules questions. Uh, you know, John briefly had it up there about uniforms. Uh, you know, we, we're looking for, you know, the one inch stripe shirts, black shorts, black pants, black kilts, or skirts. Uh, you know, we understand with pants, sometimes they might have a white stripe in them. That's fine. Uh, you know, black hats. Fortunately, our accessory color is black. Uh, I don't, if you do hockey or something, you're, you're all different fuchsias and all these other colors. So uh, black's a fairly easy color to come by. Um, so if you got any questions on uniforms, let me know. Uh, there, and I'll be happy to uh, address them. Uh, we're fortunate that Ump Attire is a really large online um, officials retailer. Uh, they are by the truck plant out on um, off of the Gene Snyder, and you can place an order, pick it up that day, um, which, which is sort of handy. But if anybody has any questions about that, let us know. Uh, hey, Chris? Yes. So uh, at the ratings day, anything about masks and whistles? Are we going to be required to wear masks or? I've asked Sacred Heart. They have not told me. Rick, are you aware of any issues with on-field restrictions? Are there any on-field restrictions uh, for rating day? Do we have to wear masks while we're refing? Uh, we just need to follow the COVID rules for officials during the year. Just all the COVID rules is what I was told. Okay. So I don't, I don't think we need to wear a mask <laughs> while we're actually officiating, but when we come off the field, we have to put a mask on. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, great point. I, I usually put a couple in my pocket just so that way when we get together and we're talking, we want to make sure we have masks. Uh, but yeah, once, once we're out there on the field of play for play, um, we don't need them. But if you want to wear a mask, that's fine. Uh, you want to use an electronic whistle, that's fine. Uh, 
have backup batteries and everything else. Uh, electronic whistles are a sort of a different breed um, and they take a while to get used to. I'm still work, working on it for me, but um, yeah, me too. that's a good, good point, Greg. But uh, yeah, so I, I suggest come, come early and just ask questions on the sideline for rating day. And then that way, when you get on the field, some questions will be answered. You'll have some time off. You'll get back on the field for a second round. I recommend, you know, staying for a little bit more if you have the opportunity just to sort of watch and learn, and then you're, you're free to go. But uh, anybody have any questions about ratings day or uh, the regular season assigning or anything? Yeah, Chris, I'm sorry. What did you say was the um, name of that store where you could get that umpire stuff? It's Ump Attire. So it's uh, the website is uh, www.ump-attire, A-T-T-I-R-E.com. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep. I have a question about the exam. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, so once you're on the U.S. lacrosse website, where do you go to take it? John. John, you muted. John's getting dinner. Oh. <laughs> Are you hoarse, John? No, I was just, I was upset. I didn't want to. Um, it's, it's on that same site as all your videos. Now, that's an easy answer. Let me get on to U.S. Lacrosse. Can, can you see my, oh, you can't see my. You can't see my, what's it, my... Uh, Can you share your screen? Profile yeah, page. Uh, yeah. let me see, page. share screen. Let me get share screen going here. All right, share. Okay, now I've got to get, okay, here we go. You got the U.S. lacrosse site. And good grief. Then I got to log in. You follow me so far? Yes. Okay, and then I, so I'm logging in. Go up to that hamburger in the left and pull down e-learning. I'm sorry, this is probably a roundabout way, but that's the only way I've been able to find. Okay, girls lacrosse officials, click on that. Now, what I do when I get to this is that hashtag 2021, whatever that says there, ODP learning. And officials, Women's game. Oh, I had checked. I clicked on. Okay. Level one. Okay. So you got onto your level one there. So it's got your online rules course, your level one learning courses, the annual rules interpretation, and then the exams. And this is the one you want to pick. Now, I know that was kind of convoluted, but that's the best way I can, I've found to get there. I think I've got that posted on my unofficial web log, how to get there. I think it's gone out in an email as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Um, the email is from the 6th of February. Say again? My email is from the 6th of February. That's the day you sent it out. Okay. I have it pulled up here. Does that work? Does that? Yeah, you the, I followed okay. it and it got me there. Okay. And there's also like a link to level one and level two or three. Um, if yes. you just click it, it'll take you there right away. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, it's generational. That's the way I've found it. So that's the way I'm doing it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'm sure you can find a better way to get there. Okay. Does that help you, Sarah? 
Yes, and then we only have to take the combined one, right? Correct. Okay. Okay, so it's been right about an hour, so we want to respect your all's time. Um, like I said, my email and, and cell numbers available. So if you have any questions, let me know. But do be expecting an email from me uh, regarding a schedule for the 28th coming out in the next couple of days. And I remember somebody asked uh, about an email for the 20th. I'll make sure that goes out again. Similar format.